Good morning, glorious church. He is risen. Jesus is risen. We want to welcome you today here, our local church family, and everyone around the world to our service this morning. And happy Resurrection Day today. Amen. Hallelujah. I want to read to you 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 38, or verse 56. I mean, <laughs> death was swallowed up by triumphant life. Who got the last word, oh death? Oh death, who's afraid of you now? And I just want to add these two words. Huh, huh? Who's afraid of you now, death? It goes on to say, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory. We have the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He's made us victorious. He's made us more than conquerors. So we celebrate his goodness today. Father, we celebrate your goodness today. We thank you for your victorious triumph today. In Jesus' name, and we all said, amen. amen. Hallelujah. Woo. Come on, just put your hands together. Put a big smile on your face. Jesus is risen. He's alive. Woo. Satan is defeated. And we've got the victory, amen? <laughs> I saw Satan fall like lightning. I saw darkness run for cover. But the miracle that I just can't get over, my name is registered in heaven. Come on, put your hands together. Woo! Satan fall. I saw Satan fall like lightning. <laughs> I saw darkness run for cover. Still the miracle that I just can't get over. My name is registered in heaven. I believe in signs and wonders. Yes, I do. I have resurrection power. The miracle that I just can't get over My name is registered in heaven And my peace belongs to you forever This is my testimony from death to life This grace rewrote my storm I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous I'll testify Spirit, Son, and Father, our God, who 
gonna let your praises I'm gonna dance I'm gonna shout Oh, I'm gonna shout I'm gonna let your praises I'll be worth to me And your mighty works are
about, for me, 27 years ago, if it had not been for the Lord. I'm so grateful that His goodness, His love, what Jesus did at the cross intersected with my life. If it had not been for the Lord, where would you be today? The grave is empty. Jesus ascended, descended into the lower parts of the earth, took upon him all our sicknesses, all our diseases, all our sins, all our shortcomings. Romans chapter 6 tells us that he was raised by the glory of God. And he took his blood and he sprinkled it on the mercy seat to give access to you and I to a position in a place of freedom. Where will we be without the Lord? As they continue to play, I, I want to read a scripture to you because I believe it, it paints such an amazing picture for each one of us. And as I read the scripture and these scriptures, I, I, want, I want you to just close your eyes and listen to these words. And this is in Isaiah 53, starting in verse 1. It says, who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of a dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain like one from whom people would hide their faces. He was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him and by his wounds we were healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us have turned to our own way and the Lord had laid on him the iniquities of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shears is silent. So he did not open his mouth. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested for he was cut off from the land of the living for the transgressions of my people, he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and to cause him to suffer. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. And through the, though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the Lord and the will of the Lord will prosper in the land. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied by his knowledge. My righteous servant will justify many and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I give him a portion among the great and he will divide the spoil with the strong because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors. If it had not been for the Lord, what Jesus has done for each one of us, we stand here as believers today. We stand here as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ with victory in our hearts because Jesus completed Jesus bought and purchased a complete victory for you and I. 
victory in your body, victory in your soul, victory in your mind. You have victory today because what Jesus did for each one of us. Oh, how he loved us. Oh, how he loved us. Father, we receive that sacrifice today. And Lord, we stand in that victory today. And where defeat has maybe tried to surround those watching today, they may have surrounded you. Today, we lift our hands. Today, we, we get a revelation of the victory that we have in Christ Jesus. A complete victory. You know, our nation is experiencing so many different things. Our nation is experiencing so, so much tor turmoil in certain parts of our country, in places in our, in our, within our own community. But I want you to know that what Jesus did at Calvary and when he took his blood to, that, to the mercy seat and, and, and the holy of holies, that was enough for what's going on today. Miss Carolyn sent me something today, last night actually, that Billy Brim sent her and as a church, we want to position ourselves in that position where God bought for us. And it is a position of authority. You see, we can stand here today, be victorious, but not just victorious, but we stand here today in a position, in a place of authority. And so as the church, uh, you know, what, what, what Billy Brim forward to her was Pat Robinson, just, just from, from 700 Club, CBN News, just made a declaration for churches all over America to stand in their positions and places of authority. That what's happening in our nation ought not be. What's happening in our communities ought not be. Why? Because we as the church have power. We as a church have authority. And we take our position because of the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. It's not just a place where we can shout our victory, but it is a position and place of authority. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 20, says, which he wrought in Christ Jesus. Let me read verse 19. And what is exceeding greatness of his power to us word who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ, when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality and power, might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also that which is to come, and have put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. See, we just talked about Christ was raised from the dead. So why? So all principality, all power, all might, all dominion that he was given to the church. Say, say this with me, that power has been given to the church. And because power and authority has given to the church, it's been given to me. And we as the church, we stand in that power and we stand in authority today. Hallelujah. All things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Hallelujah. The fullness fills all in all. So right now as the church, as ones that have all power and are all authority, let's take authority over what's happening in our nation today. Hallelujah, thank you, Father. Father, we, your church, we stand in that authority today. Hallelujah. We seated in that position, in that place, seated with you in heavenly places. We are not a weak church, we're not a dead church. We're not a church barely getting by. We're not, not a church that's crumbling in fear. We are a church that's standing in power, standing in authority. And we take, we take authority with our words today. We take authority, hallelujah, because it's been given to us. It's a rightful place. It's a rightful position. And we stand strong, just like Jesus stood in the bow of the boat and he said, peace be still. We say, peace be still in this nation. And we command coronavirus to die in this nation. 
We command fear to leave in the name of Jesus. We command where sickness and disease is, we declare that health and wholeness is flooding this nation. We have authority, and we have authority to speak in this world. We have authority to declare in this world. We have authority to decree a thing, and it is established. So we decree that this is over. This has come to an end. You go. Things change in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Give him a shout of praise right where you are. Hallelujah. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Father. Hallelujah. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, you are victorious. Hallelujah. If fear and timidity, confusion and hopelessness is surrounding you right now, by faith, declare this. I am free because the Son has set me free. I'm free today because of the love of God that has been poured out for me. In Jesus' name. If you receive that today, if you believe that today, give him a shout of praise. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah for your goodness and your faithfulness. Hallelujah. I thank you, Father, that this is resurrection day. This is resurrection today. Jesus is alive. Hallelujah. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. Oh, so, so grateful that you joined us today. And we believe throughout the rest of the service and throughout the rest of our time together, we, I believe that the healing power of God is working in your home, working your cars. I believe the peace of God is flowing right where you are today. And I believe as you hear the word today, you will never be the same. You will never be the same. Hallelujah, because his word is enough. What Jesus, did at the Cal what Jesus did at Calvary is enough for you. Amen. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. What a great day to be alive. What a great day to celebrate the goodness of God. What a great day to know that the best is yet to come. Shake off discouragement. Shake it off. It doesn't belong in your life. It doesn't belong controlling you in any way. You are a child of the Most High God. If we could just get a complete, total revelation of who we are in Christ Jesus, you will not live defeated in another day in your life. Think about it. If you, really, if you realized that you were a child of God and you realized that you are a son and daughter of God, you would never li live another day of defeat in your life. And to me, that's what the, that's what the message of the cross is all about. It's a, and, it's, and it's why we celebrate this every year. It's a reminder. It's a celebration. It's a revelation. It's an understanding that I get to be victorious, that I am above and not beneath. I'm above only and not beneath. I'm blessed coming in and I'm blessed going out. The curse cannot hold me. The curse was broken. So don't keep meditating on the curse in your life. Don't keep rehearsing the curses that are in your life. Don't keep rehearsing past failures, past defeats. Don't keep going over your mind on how bad you are or what you've done wrong or, or what this person has done to you or how you were treated or how you were raised. Meditate on the victory. Meditate on the finished work. Meditate. Don't meditate on the report of the doctor. Medit what is the report of the Lord? The report is of the Lord is that Jesus went to the very throne room of God and settled it once and for all, for all humanity. Hallelujah. You are victorious today. I have joy today because of a completed work. I have joy today because the grave is empty and Satan is defeated. How about you? How about you? Thank you, Father. 
Man, if you could just think about that and meditate on that and allow that to, to all, until a, a wellspring of joy rises up on the inside of you. That wellspring of joy. I, I just think of the, the, the woman at the well when Jesus said that there is water and this water is a wellspring of life flowing up into eternal life. She's like, give me this water. Give me this water. I don't know about you, but, but we need this water every day. We need this water every day. Stop rehearsing what might be going on in the present or what happened yesterday. Rehearse the finished victory. Amen. Amen. I'm excited to, to deliver a resurrection message to you today. And I believe this message is going to empower you and strengthen you. Not just solidify what you might already know, but it's going to empower you in the season that we're living in. And I believe all you say, yeah, this, this, it, these are hard times out there. Yeah, there's, these are difficult things. But remember back when this all first started, and so there's something that you heard me say about Jesus. It's, I said this, that Jesus never denied sickness, disease, or lack, but he never glorified it either. Amen. We glorify our Father which is in heaven. We glorify what's been done. Amen. It was a few weeks ago, and, and I love that song that, that, uh, that Cassie wrote. And, you know, uh, that song was birthed out of, uh, of just really with a little place in my heart for this day just a, a couple months ago. And uh, with the Lord put in my heart, and he, he said on Easter Sunday, on Resurrection Sunday, I want you to, and he just gave me this one word, and he said this word, driven. Driven. So I, I just, re, you know, released that to our team, and, and, and it was, we were, I believe we were on our way to, on spring break, and Cassie sent me a text, and she said, just the Lord gave me a song called Driven. And I believe it's such a powerful song, and just even some of the words in that song that no sickness, no pain could ever keep me down. I love that. I love that. Nothing is going to hold me back from the purpose that God has for me. The enemy is not going to hold me back. The enemy is not going to hold me back. You realize that the enemy is already defeated? When I understood that, and I'm like, wait a minute, I'm facing this right now. I'm going through this right now. My mind is dealing with this right now. I have this sickness right now. I'm having these thoughts or these temptations right now. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm, I'm a winner. I'm victorious. But this word driven, and, and I just kept meditating on the word driven, and, and, and I went to the, de the, the dictionary and, and started meditating on, on, on the different aspects of this definition. And Webster's 1828 says this about the word driven. It says, urged forward by force. It means compelled to move. It also means to be constrained by necessity. I'm talking about driven this morning, being urged on by force, being compelled to move, being constra constrained by necessity. And there's another definition, and this is what I want to deal with, and it's this, relentlessly compelled by the need to accomplish a goal. Let me say that again. Driven, relentlessly compelled by the need to accomplish a goal, a goal. Relentlessly. I mean, what is relentless? It's not giving up, meaning it's never, it's never stopping. It's never, it's never giving up, meaning it's relentless. I'm so grateful for a mom's relentless love. I'm so grateful for a mom's relentless prayers. Mom and dad's relentless prayers. I'm so grateful for people like Dr. Savell and Miss Carolyn that were relentless in, their, in the call on their lives. Right. Relentless. That's what driven is. It's relentlessly compelled. What is compelled? Compelled is, is, is I can't, I've got to do this. It's not a, being compelled to do something is not, you know, so-so or, you know, I could do this. Being compelled is I've got to do this. I've, I've, got to, I've got to do this. There's no, no other way about it. 
relentlessly compelled by the need to accomplish a goal. And I think about this as it pertains to what we want to deal with today. Think about driven, relentlessly compelled by the need to accomplish a goal. When I think of this, I, I first thought of God. God's heart to, had to create something, to create mankind. To be able to fellowship with. That, that God was driven to, to create something, establish, establish a, a being, to establish humanity that would worship him in spirit and truth. Not, not worship, him, worship him because they had to, but worship them because their heart and their compassion and their desire was to worship him. When I think about driven, relentlessly compelled by the need to accomplish a goal. I think of humanity. And humanity, they had this on the inside of them that they were already in the image of God. Yeah. Relentlessly compelled. You see, every single one of us are driven by something. Every, all of humanity is driven by something. Yeah. Relentlessly compelled for the need to accomplish a goal. Now, being driven doesn't mean you're busy. You can be driven to be lazy. You can be driven to take a nap. You can be driven to go eat. You can be driven... So, so being driven just doesn't mean you're busy. Being driven meaning that you're compelling to reach a goal. Yes. And at one time, Adam and Eve, they had this, this drive on the inside of them that they want to, wanted to fellowship with God, that they would walk with God in the cool of the day, that, that they, would, they would seek after God. But, but all of a sudden, at, at one point in one season, and we don't know how often or how often this might have happened or how long this took place, but eventually the goal on the inside of humanity changed. They went from being driven to walk with God to being driven to have doubts about how they were created into the point that, to the point that they would, if they just ate of this particular fruit in the garden, that they would be like God. So what happens? They were being driven to this fruit. They were being driven to this, this aspect or this desire to be like God. All of a sudden, something shifted in, on the inside of them. Something shifted in them to where they weren't dri dri driven to, to and relentlessly pursue after this other thing. They were pursuing after this other thing. And when they took part of this, it caused them now to be driven by something else. Driven by shame. Driven by fear. Driven by guilt. Driven by fear. See, when you're driven by the wrong things, it will lead you into wrong places, into wrong destinations. Every one of us are driven by something. What are you relentlessly pursuing? What is your goal? What, what are you relentlessly compelled by the need to accomplish? But I'm so grateful that even in the midst of man's fall, even in the midst of when they were driven by something else that would drive them away, their, drive them away from their purpose or their destiny, I'm so grateful that God was still driven. I'm so grateful that God was still driven, that, that, that God still had a drive, that God was still relentlessly compelled to accomplish a goal. What was his goal? His goal was you and me. His goal was humanity. His, his goal was to, was to have a family that would fellowship with him. This morning, I want to talk to you about the gospel, maybe in a little different way than you may have heard it, heard it before, but this is the gospel, that God was driven, compelled, a goal to have a family, but yet man was driven to go in another direction. But God was driven 
So much so that when, when he was in the garden and, and man fell, he, he looked at the serpent and cursed him and, and, said, and said that you will crawl on the, on the dust of your belly and you shall eat dust. And he said this to the serpent. He said, there's one coming. There's, see, God was driven. He was relentless in his pursuit for humanity. Relentless in his pursuit for humanity. And said, and said, there's one coming and he is going to bruise your head and you're going to bruise his heel. God was relentless. God was driven. What is driven is being relentlessly compelled by the need to accomplish a goal. God was relentless. Go to Isaiah chapter 43. Isaiah 43. Celebrating the resurrection to me today is about celebrating a God that was driven. That was relentlessly pursuing you and I. Pursuing humanity. Before I read Isaiah 43, I want, I want to read Exodus 6 to you. You can make, just make note of this. Exodus 6. I believe it's verse 5 through 7. It says, Therefore tell the Israelites... I am the Lord and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians and deliver you from their bondage. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people and I will be your God. What are we hearing here? We are hearing a God that's driven after humanity. What is, what, what's happening here? The children of Israel, God's people are bound, but yet God says, says this, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and a mighty acts of judgment and I will take you as my people. I will be your God then you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I want you to know that God is driven today. God is driven. If you don't know God, I want you to know that he is running after you today. That he is relentlessly pursuing you today. Why? Because his goal has always been the same. It is to have a family and it is to have a personal relationship with you. When God's, God's people had turned their backs on him, and put themselves in bondage to the Egyptians in the midst of that, God said, I will redeem you. Hallelujah. Look at Isaiah 43, verse 1. And I'm going to read this in the Amplified Classic. It says, But now in the spite of past judgments for Israel's sins, thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. Listen to that. Don't fear. Why? I've redeemed you. Don't fear today. Why? Because God's redeemed you. I've ransomed you by paying a price instead of leaving you captives. Wow. I love that. I have redeemed you. I've ransomed you by paying a price instead of leaving you captives. I have called you by your name. You are mine. God's relentlessly pursuing you today. He's driven Verse two says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overwhelm you. Now, think, if you're overwhelmed today, I want you to know that God's with you today. Why? Because he's driven. He's just, just as driven today as he ever was. Relentlessly compelled for the need to accomplish a goal. Thank you, Father. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned or scorched nor will the flame kindle upon you. Why? For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt to the Babylonians for your ransom, Ethiopia and Seba, Seba a province of Ethiopian, in exchange, what, for your release? Because you are precious in my sight and honored, and because I love you. Man, just, just think about that for a moment. This is God speaking to you and I. This is after the, 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 them being in bondage to the, to the Egyptians. Now he's talking about being in bondage to again. And he's saying, I'm going to redeem you. If you're overwhelmed, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to cause you to be victorious. And he says, why? Because you're precious in my sight. And why? Because I love 
you. Wow. Man. Why would he go through all this trouble, so to speak? Because he's driven. He's relentlessly pursuing. Why? Because he desires to accomplish a goal. And what's that goal today? It's you and I. Because you're precious in his sight. And because he loves you. I can't help but think how my life intersected with an opportunity 27 years ago. Not because I deserved it. Not because I earned it. Not because... I cleaned myself up to a certain place, not because I was better than someone or, or anything like that. I, I, I also just received this understanding that he loves me. He loves me. You're precious in his sight today. And he loves you today. I mean, we know these, these scriptures through the word. You know John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world... He did nothing. No, you know that. For God so loved the world, he was driven. He was compelled. Meaning, think about this. God has so much loved you that he's holding his most priceless prized possession on the inside of him, holding it with his hands. And he says, I love them so much. I'm driven. I'm compelled by necessity. Why? Because there's a goal I've got to accomplish. I've got to accomplish this. I can't be separated from my creation. I can't be separated from, 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 from my, my family. I can't be separated from them. And this is thousands of years later. 6,000 years later, and God is still saying, I've got to be with my creation. I've got to be with my family. Look at them. They're broken. Look at them. They're lost. Look at them. They're sick. They're in poverty. They're diseased. They're, they're, they're under a curse, and I never wanted them to live under a curse, but there they are, and they're cursed. God is saying, I love them so much. I gave my only begotten son. He was driven so much he gave his only begotten son. So what? So that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Then I love verse 17. It says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. But the world through him. Thank you, Father. That he did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but the world through him might have eternal life. Why? Because he's driven. And I think about his love for us and I think about that. I, I, I think of Galatians 4, verse 4. He said, in the fullness of time. What's he talking about? He's, he, he's saying, you know what I said in, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 14, 15, and 16, when I said there's one coming? In Galatians 4, that's, he says, in the fullness of time. I mean, what I said 6,000 years ago in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, born under the woman, born, born of a woman, born under the curse, that, that those that are under the curse might be free to redeem them that were under the curse. Why? Why did God do that? Why? Because he loves you. And he sent Jesus. But not only did God, not only is God driven, not only did he send Jesus, but I want you to know that just as much as God had to be, Jesus had to be driven. I think sometimes we have this idea that it was easy for Jesus to do what he did. Let's go to, let's go to Luke chapter 24. Luke 24. It wasn't easy for Jesus to do what he did. Why? Because he became a man. And he laid down all his rightful deity. And was going to have to experience separation from his father. He was going to have to, now get this, experience. Get this, the sin and sickness of all humanity. 
Think about the weight of that. That's why it wasn't easy. Jesus had to be driven. Jesus had to be relentlessly compelled for a need to accomplish a goal. I believe if Jesus wasn't driven, he would have given in in the temptations in the garden. I believe if Jesus wasn't driven, I believe he would have given in to that temptation in the garden of Gethsemane when he sweated those great drops of blood. Jesus had to be driven. Let's, let's look at this in, in Luke chapter 24. Verse 1. It says, Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared, and certain others with them. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher. And they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. Praise the Lord. And it came to pass as they, as they were much perplexed thereabout. Behold, two men stood by in shining garments. And as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why, ye, why, do, you the li, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke unto you when he was yet in Galilee. Why do you seek for the living among the dead? And it says, remember what he said to you. What did Jesus say to them? Verse 7, the son of man must, 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 must be delivered into the hands of sinful men. And he must be crucified and he must rise again on the third day. You see, Jesus was driven. What did he tell the disciples? I must be delivered into the hands of sinful men. I must. See, must speaks of I have to do this. Must speaks of necessity. Must speaks of being compelled must speaks of being relentless. I must be placed in the hands of sinful men. I must be crucified and what I must rise from the again on the third day. Jesus, just as much as God, was driven. In John chapter nine, I believe it's verse four, he says, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is still day. See, this, this is a sense of urgency on the inside of the heart of Jesus. This is, this is urgency speaking. This is, this is, I've got to press through this. I have to do this. I believe that's why even he talked to Peter the way he did. And he told Peter, get behind me, Satan. Why? Because that was a temptation to him. That was, I've got to go to Jerusalem. Why? Because I have to be crucified and I have to rise again. I must work the works of him that sent me while it's still day. In Luke chapter 2, verse 49, he says this. He, he talks to his parents as a young child and he said, didn't you know where I'd be? Didn't, didn't you know where I'd be? That I'd be in my father's house and about my father's business? I'm telling you, there's, there was a, a, a drive on the inside of Jesus. And every temptation that Jesus faced was to cause him to be driven in another direction. But yet he said, I must do this. I must accomplish this. Go to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father, that he is driven. That he is driven for each one of us today. John chapter 6. Verse 38, this is Jesus speaking. For I came down, for I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. I didn't come to do my own will, but what did I do? I came to do the will 
of the one who sent me. Meaning, meaning my will doesn't matter. I'm driven to do his will. I'm driven to accomplish his goal. I didn't come down to fulfill what I wanted to fill is what Jesus is saying. I came down to fulfill his will. Jesus was driven. Verse 40 says, and this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone that seeth the son and believes on him may have everlasting life and I will raise him up at the last day. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 10. Just want you to see some of these scriptures today. Because Jesus had to be driven. If not, he would have been driven in another direction. He had to be driven to fulfill the will of his Father. In Hebrews chapter 10, thank you, Father. Verse 7, in the Amplified, it says this Then I said, Behold, here I am, coming to do your will, O God, to fulfill what is written of me in the volume of the book. What, was Jesus, what did Jesus declare? He was declaring Psalms 40. He was declaring a messianic psalm. He was declaring, why am I here? I'm here to do your will. Behold, I am here coming to do your will, O oh God. What was Jesus here for? He was here and driven to fulfill the will of God. And what was the will of God? You and me. You and I. That was the will of the Father. And Jesus came, Jesus came down to accomplish and fulfill that will. And what's that will? It's you and I. Why? Because you're precious. And why? Because he loves you. Go to, go to Galatians chapter 1. Mm, thank you, Father. Galatians 1. Thank you, Father. Galatians 1, verse 4. In the King James, it says, mm. Who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world. Wow. Who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world. Wow. According to the will of God and our Father. We could read the scripture like this. Thank you, Father. Because of the will of of God, Jesus gave himself for our sins that he would deliver us from this present evil world. Wow. Jesus was driven to accomplish God's will. What was his will? That you will be delivered from this present evil world. What's evil? Sickness is evil. What's evil? Disease is evil. What's evil? Poverty and lack. What's evil? Anger, bondage, oppression. What's evil? Addiction. What's evil? Anything that's pulling you away from God's plan and purpose for your life. And it was Jesus was driven. I love that it says, who gave... He gave himself. You see, it wasn't just God gave, all of a sudden it had to shift to Jesus said, he gave himself. See, it's one thing when God says, I'm going to give my only son, but it's another thing for that son to say, I'm going to give myself for them to do what? To deliver them from this evil world, this present evil world. Just lift your hands right where you are. Oh, Father, I thank you that you were driven. You were driven for us. You were compelled for us. You know, I think of, I think of that. I th think of the, the scripture in Hebrews 12. We talk about where it says, look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. It says, for the joy that was set before him, 
for the, now get this, for the joy that was set before him. See, he had this goal out in front of him. He had this, this picture, this image out, on the, out in front of him for the joy that was set before him. What was the joy? The joy wasn't dying. The joy wasn't going to hell. The joy wasn't stripes in his back. The joy, was, the joy was you and I for the joy that was set before him. He endured the cross. Not just that, but it said he despised the shame. What does that mean? See, that was, think of everyone's looking at him. Everyone's accusing him. He's taking on the, the, the oppression of the whole world. Think of just the shame that you might have felt when you messed up or when you did wrong. He took on the shame of the whole world. What is that shame? What is that shame? That shame is the feeling that God has separated himself from you. And Jesus said he had to despise the shame. Why? Because he knew the outcome. Why? Because he was driven. He was driven. He was driven. I mean, if we just look at Jesus' life, he was driven to be in God's house as a young child. He was driven to find out who he was in the word. He was driven to be baptized by John the Baptist. He was driven into the wilderness. He was driven by the Holy Spirit out to step into his purpose and his call. He was driven to destroy the works of the enemy. He was driven to go about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil because he knew that God was with him. He was driven to seek and save that which was lost. He was driven. He said, I must go through Samaria. Uh, he was driven to go through Samaria to set a woman free so she could go back and set a whole town free. He was driven to, to, to tell his disciples, go find a, 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 a donkey tied. Go get him. He was driven to get on that donkey and ride into Jerusalem. He was driven to go into, into God's house. Why? Because it said, the zeal of my father's house has eaten me up. He was driven into that house to chase out all the money changers. He was driven into the Garden of Gethsemane. He was driven to sweat, sweat drape, 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 great drops of blood. He was, he was driven to say, say, Lord, just, you know, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. He was driven. He was driven to lay, lay his life down in the garden. He was, he was driven to, to surrender his life. He was driven to let people To, he, he, he was driven to let someone betray him. He was driven to be accused wrongly. I, I, get, I had this picture in one of the scriptures when it talks about when Jesus you know, was, was, was taken captive and Paul was there before he heard the, the cock crow and, and it said, and Peter seeing Jesus and Jesus looking at Peter and, and I, I can just see this, the whole time that Jesus was going through, through these things, what was the joy set before him? He was looking at you. Just think when, when, when he ha was having his beard plucked out, he was looking at you. When they put a crown of thorns in his head, he was, he was driven. Why? Because he was looking at you. When they laid stripe after stripe and stripe after stripe upon his back, he was driven. Why? Because he was looking at you. They make fun of him and put a robe on him and, 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 and do all those things and make a display of him openly and, and everyone's saying, crucify, crucify him, crucify him. All the while, he's driven, why? Because he's looking at you. Thank you, Father. Why he's holding the cross, going to the place he's going to die and, 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 and just and, and losing all strength and, and he's doing that. He's all the while, I believe, he's, he's, he's struggling to, to make it through the streets with that cross on his shoulder. I, I believe he's driven wild because he's, why? Because he's looking at you. 
So much so so that he couldn't even bear the cross anymore and they had to get someone else to bear the cross all the way to Golgotha. And I, I believe as, as every swing of the, of the hammer that hit every, every, every nail into his wrist and into, the, into his feet, that every swing of that ax, I believe he was looking at you. He was driven because he's looking at you. And I, and I believe as he's up on the cross and, and they pierce his side, I believe he's looking at you. And as he looked at his father and, he, and he's saying, why have you forsaken me? I believe all the while, He's looking at you. Why? Because what did he say? Forgive them for they know not what they do. Why? Because he was looking at them. When he said it, it is finished, I believe the last thing he saw was our faces. But I'm so grateful that God's driven So grateful that Jesus is driven. Jesus was driven. He went to the lower parts of the earth. There he was driven. He was driven in the lower parts of the earth. He was forsaken. He, was, he took on the weight and sin of all of us. He was driven. Even in that place, he, he preached the gospel. The epistle said that he led captivity captive. Uh, and I'm so grateful that God was driven because in that moment when he was in the, in the lower parts of the earth, it said the glory of God, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, quickened our mortal bodies, the same spirit. Uh, uh, Romans 6 says that Jesus was raised by the glory of God, that when the spirit of God went into the lower parts of the earth and there started to be a rumble and there started to be the shake, what was it? God was driven. Why? Because he had to raise his son up so he could raise you and I up. Why? Because God and his son were driven so much so that when Jesus arose he told them don't handle me don't touch me I haven't yet ascended to the father why because Jesus was driven and he went into the mercy seat the holy of holies and he purchased all humanity Thank you, Jesus. Driven. He's relentlessly compelled by necessity to accomplish a goal. Let me ask you a question today. What's driving you? What's driving you? Are you on autopilot today? Or are you living for a greater purpose? What are you, what's driving you today? Everything begins at the cross. What's driving you today? It was all for you, it was all for me. What's driving you? What are you relentlessly pursuing today? Are you pursuing things that are of meaningless value? Or are you pursuing something of eternal value? I believe we're stepping into the greatest days the church has ever seen. But also know that Jesus is coming soon. Let me ask you, what's driving you? Are you being driven by self? Are you being driven by a greater purpose? Thank you, Father. You know, when I got born again 27 years ago, it was about 20 years, a little over 20 years ago that I moved to Texas. And my first year after I was here in Texas, I went to, I had the opportunity to go to Israel. And one day we were in Israel and we were at the Valley of Elah. And we just finished there and there were some people who had gone into some shops that were right there. And I remember when uh, I was sitting on the bus and just waiting for people to get back on the bus and, and I was about to, we were about to leave to the next place and I'm sitting there and the Holy Spirit says something to me. He says, Justin, I want you to, I want you to go into that store there. I'm like, I, I don't, I, you know, I don't want, want to buy anything. I don't, and the Holy Spirit said, I want you to go into that store right there. 
I'm like, why do you want me to go into that store right there? I, mean, I just kind of brush it off for a moment, and he got louder. He goes, go into that store right there. And so I get out, and so I go into the store, and, and it's a jewelry store. And I go and I walk around the store, and all of a sudden, I get in front of this one case, and, and it's nothing but rings in that case. And, and I'm looking down, I'm looking, okay, okay, what do you want me to do? And, and just as, as plain as that, I could see it like it was almost like this big in front of me. And it was this ring. And, and, and the Lord was like, I want, you to, I want you to buy that ring. And I asked, the, I asked the person behind the counter, how much is this ring? And they said, it was $25. Okay, I bought a $25 ring. But as I'm looking at it and I go to purchase it, I get back on the bus and the Lord says, I want you to take it out. And I want you to look at it. And he, uh, and, he's, and, he, and he took me back to just the story of David and Goliath. And he said that David had a purpose to change his world around him. And the ring I purchased was this ring for 20 some years ago. It's nothing special. It's just... I mean, it's special to me, but is in the natural, it's not something valuable. It's $25. But yet what it is, it's two reeds of silver that are beaten together, beaten and hammered together and bound to make a ring. It's not even things, it doesn't even have a perfect seal on the back. But he told me this. He goes, Justin, wear this ring and realize that you have always have a greater purpose. That your purpose is greater than you. And as you wear this ring, realize that you're no longer to live for yourself, but you're to live for others. You're no longer called to live for yourself, but you're called to live and proclaim my name. So yes, we can look at Easter. We, we're so great when we look at the Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, that we're victorious. But also see that not only was God driven and Jesus driven, but you and I, we have to be driven. Why? Because there's a hurting world out there. No greater time than now to be driven by his love, driven by the word, driven to the Holy Spirit, driven by the Holy Spirit, dri driven in places, and, and, and places of destiny and purpose to change our community and change our world. So I've worn this ring for 20 real, realized, years realizing that God's saying, you can't do this without me. And I want you to know, if you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, you'll have an opportunity in a moment. Maybe you've been born again for 20 years. I want you to realize you have a greater purpose. What's driving you? Thank you, Father. As I pray, I'm going to have Pastor Rick come. Thank you, Father. Father, I thank you for the word that was sown. And right now, we open our hearts for what the Holy Spirit desires to do right now. In our midst. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Continue with that prayer. Father, we thank you for your word that never returns void. Uh, thank you for Pastor Justin and the anointing that's on his life to pastor us, to continue to impart unto us wisdom, revelation, and knowledge that's coming straight from the throne room of you, our personal Savior. And uh, we love you, and we bless you, and we thank you uh, for your word that will never return void, that will always do what it set out to do. You sent Jesus, the incorruptible seed, your word made flesh. And he lived the life that gives us the opportunity to have life and life to the fullest. And Holy Spirit, I ask you as I minister your word, as you flow through me, that you just uh, work on the hearts and minds of people that may need to uh, have a relationship with you or get back into a relationship with you or stir up their faith so they can be who you created them to be. And I thank you, Lord, that you will always do what your word says you will do. And as Jesus is high and lifted up, you will draw all men to him. Holy Spirit, have your way in these next few minutes. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, as we think about what Pastor Justin just preached, I think there's three different types of people that we have to recognize in this. 
You may be at home right now and maybe your mom, your grandma, somebody just said, hey, you know what? You need to at least uh, give God some due in, in this season. And, and maybe seeking God will be the answer for you. This may be a, uh, a time in your life that you're like, is God for real or is he not? Look at the world and what's going on in the world. Uh, that could be you. There could be another person that's on the other side of, uh, of this camera that, you know what? You've been living for Jesus. You've known Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, but you haven't been driven to live the life that you know that you're called to live. Uh, you've just been uh, playing patty cakes with the, with the Word of God rather than taking the Word of God for what it's meant to be. And that's a, a sword to help you fight the battles that you're facing right now. And not just fight those battles, but to overcome in every single one of those battles. And you know what? There's some other of you that may be sitting there uh, this morning, and the reality of it is you've been fighting. You're in the midst of it. You may be feeling worn down. Uh, you, may be, uh, you may be lit up. You may be excited about what you're hearing this morning. Uh, and that's important because you are super important for the other two people to be a light for them. You know, I was thinking about, Lord, what do you want to talk about? about this morning? What do you want to minister to your people uh, to give them the hope that they need and to stir them back into the relationship that they're called to be in? And that relationship is with you. And I was reminded of a couple of different scriptures. Uh, Second Chronicles 20 was one. Colossians chapter two was another. And Acts chapter 16 was another. And Colossians chapter two it says what Pastor Justin has been eloquently speaking to us this morning, the reality that Jesus spoiled principalities. He spoiled principalities, triumphing over them. There's some principalities roaming around in our world today that Jesus has already bought the victory for us over those principalities. I'm reminded of 2 Chronicles chapter 20. It's a great scripture passage. and It talks about uh, when the Israelites were in a serious battle. They were worn out. They were tired. They didn't know what to do, but you know what they did? They went after God. They fasted and they prayed and they sought the Lord. And then the word of the Lord came to them. In the process of the word of the Lord coming to them, they got excited. And that scripture is a real popular passage if you've gone to church a few times. And it says, believe in the Lord your God, so shall you be established. Believe in his prophet, so shall you prosper. Well, I tell you what. We believe in the word of the Lord. We believe in our God. And that word is, in 2020, God is opening a new door. And he's bringing about supernatural increase like never before. That means naturally, when we look around right now, it's chaotic. You're going, what's going on in our natural world today? But you know what? We don't serve a natural God. We serve a supernatural God. Jehovah everything, everything you need him to be is what he'll be for you. And in that passage of scripture, I think it's really cool because uh, you know what they do? They begin to do something. And you know I have a part to play. And our part is, you know what? Praise God. Praise God for what he's done through Jesus Christ. Praise God for what he's doing right now in the midst of our circumstances. Praise God in every circumstance that we go through. In the process of this, when they began to sing and to praise, all of a sudden, the Spirit of the Lord sent ambushments against their enemies. That's right. God began to work on their behalf because they were praising Him. You got up this morning. If you're watching this today, it's because you got up with an expectation that Jesus is Lord. And with that expectation, you sang, some of you jumped, you danced, you spun around. Because why? You know that Jesus has already spoiled those principalities. And we're walking through this life triumphantly, no matter what the rest of the world looks like. We are walking in the authority that God's given us, and we're being victorious. And the last thing I want you to, last scripture that I want to share with you is in Acts chapter 16. In Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas, they've just been beaten. They were bloody. They were thrown in the prison. And you know what they did in the midst of their circumstance? They began to sing and to praise. And you know what's so cool? As all the other prisoners around them began to hear them sing and to praise. And all of a sudden, an earthquake came. And all of a sudden, all of their bands were loosed. You see, your praise, child of the Most High God, is affecting everybody around you right now. You and I created to be more than conquerors, to be victorious. But that victory is not just for us, but it's for everybody else around us. 
So you're one of those three people. And maybe you're watching today and you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life. You say, Pastor Rick, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm talking about Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, that when heaven and earth pass away, because it's going to pass away, he's going to stand on his throne forever, and you can be seated right there with him by making Jesus the Lord of your life. I want to pray a simple prayer with you, and then I want to pray with the other two in just a minute. Pray this prayer out loud. If you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, pray this prayer. Say, Father God, in the name of Jesus, I come to you. I believe that Jesus died for me and that you raised him from the dead. And I choose to make Jesus the Lord of my life. Thank you, Jesus, for going to that cross. And thank you, Father God, for raising him from the dead. In Jesus' name, amen. I got a challenge for you other two because you know what, you've known Jesus. And some of you, you know what? You need to start doing what you know. You need to start doing what the Word of God says to do. You need to be the light that you were created to be. And you know what? It's our responsibility to make sure everyone around us knows who Jesus is. We've been given the ministry of reconciliation. Get your shout on. Get your praise on. Get excited about what's, what you once were excited about. Be excited about what Jesus has done for you. Let the light of the love of God flow through you to everyone that you talk to, everyone that you uh, Facebook, uh, put on Facebook or Instagram or FaceTime or Zoom. Let the glow of the glory of God resonate in you and, and on you anywhere and everywhere you go. Let Jesus be the light through you to the world around you. You and I cre were created to be champions. And maybe you've backslidden. Maybe you're, you know what, I've known Jesus. You know what it says in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9? It says this very simple thing. If you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you of those sins. You know what? You and I, as believers, we make mistakes. And whatever those mistakes were, the blood of Jesus was big enough and awesome enough to wash it away just like he did when you first made him the Lord of your life. And all you gotta say is, Jesus, forgive me. Repent, turn about, stop doing what you've been doing and do what you know to do. And that's what God says to do. And that's be a victorious child of the most high God. Take his word and let it be a light to those around you all the time. We love you. God loves you. We're excited about what God's doing in your life. If you made a decision for Jesus today, please email us, Heritage of Faith, oh, info at heritageoffaith.com. We love you. We're praying for you. We believe in you. And get excited and share your love with others around you. Amen. Nikki's going to come up and take, receive the offering. Good morning, Heritage family. It's so good to be with you this morning. There's nothing like Easter Sunday. There's nothing like the resurrection. If you're like me, you woke up this morning and you just couldn't wait for this broadcast. Over 2,000 years ago, Jesus went to the cross and came back to life so that we could have life. Oh, what a wonderful day this is. I'm so excited. No better day is there than to bring our tithes and offerings, to give the gift to our King of Kings, amen, to worship him with everything that we are. I have my offering here. I am gonna give you time to get your offering, your tithes and offerings, but I wanna pray over you, and then I wanna read you something. Father, I just thank you. Thank you, thank you that you were driven to love us. Thank you that you sent your son because you so loved us. There's nothing like your love. So Father, as a token of our love and appreciation, our worship for you, we bring our tithes and offerings to you today. We present them to you out of sincere love because you are good and you are great and you love us. It's because you first loved us that we love you. So Father, be magnified, glorified, and praised by our tithes and offerings today. Father, I pray for every giver. I thank you that their faith will go to new levels in their giving because of their understanding of your great love for them. Father, I thank you that you'll bless them. I thank you that their homes are blessed, their children are blessed, 
their families are blessed, their jobs are blessed, and they're a blessing everywhere they go. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me read you something real quick. God gave this to me this morning. He saved me. He redeemed me. He came for me. I'm going to try not to cry. To give me life eternally. His great love for me drove him to Calvary for my victory. The cross enduring, the shame despising, the scourging, the flogging, that awful tree. He did it for me to set me free. How can I not love this King of Kings? Driven to die for my victory. A nothing, a nobody, only he could see what I could be. Today I bring my gift, my offering. It's not just money, it's all of me. And all my life I purpose to be a living testimony of that victory. Amen. We love you. Thank you, Jesus. We love you. Man, that was so good. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Nikki. Wow. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. God is so good. Oh, we just thank you for everything that took place in today's service. We thank you for your presence. Thank you that you are driven. You're relentless after us. Holy Spirit, help us to be relentless after him. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. Annette and I, we love you. Dr. Savell and Ms. Carolyn, love you. Just encourage you next Sunday on our live broadcast next Sunday morning, Dr. Savell will be ministering. So be praying for him this week and him, Miss Carolyn, and, and believing there'll be a word in season that will change our life and take our church body and church family to another level. We love you. God bless. Have a great resurrection Sunday. Bye-bye.